Hey YouTubers, this is the Gold Standard Caesar 924 coming at you with another video for you guys today. So I was just watching Good Mike Works commentary video regarding about WWE's pay-per-view scheduling and how oversaturated WWE has gotten when it comes to these monthly pay-per-views throughout the years. And it sort of inspired me to come up on here and basically my take on how I would structure WWE's pay-per-view schedule, but just more of a like a fantasy booking of how I would structure some of these said pay-per-views throughout the course of the 12 months. And you know, with WWE, I mean, we've recently had stomping grounds, and it's just one of those really mind-boggling pay-per-view names that WWE has thought of in recent years. It's either that or it's Great Balls of Fire. And then factoring in some of those gimmick pay-per-views that we've had with like TLC, Hell in a Cell, you know, Money in the Bank to a certain degree. All these gimmick-based pay-per-views that we've had throughout the past 10 years, hard to believe that they started doing these gimmick pay-per-views. I mean, they've just been wearing out their welcome. They're just really milking all those gimmick matches with, for all it's worth with no real story behind some of these matches that are featured in these said match stipulations. So you'll have like a Hell in a Cell match every October and then you will have like a bunch of random matches like random feuds being thrown in these high stipulated matches for no reason. And that's kind of one of those things that I really hate when it comes to, to like these gimmick matches. The thing with, you know, not just gimmick base pay-per-views alone, but also just how bl over bloated or how oversaturated WWE has been when it comes to producing all these pay-per-views like every single month, or you'll have like two pay-per-views within one single month. Like we had like stomping grounds and then the, the uh, international event with super showdown. There's hardly any time to build up for your next show. You have Raw, you have SmackDown. I mean, Raw is like three hours and it has been that way since 2012. SmackDown, which was, which has been a two hour show since it premiered in 1999. I mean, those shows are like back to back and there's just a lot of like oversaturation when it comes to WWE programming. And that along with the fact that they're doing the wild card rule isn't really doing them any favors. They're always having the same like wrestlers facing off against one another and the same people that are featured on Raw and SmackDown. It's just the way that they've been structuring some of their shows, it's just way too much. And maybe that's an understatement, but getting back to my rant on the WWE pay-per-view system, and especially when it comes to their scheduling in recent years, it's just... Like, there's hardly any time to build up for your shows. And I can understand why they did it that way. Because, like, ever since the mid-90s when WWE started producing In Your House events. So, you know, when they started out, they were, like, two hours. And you would have, like, maybe five or six matches featured on the show. And then as time wore on, because, you know, their rival company, WCW at the time, was also... Uh, producing more and more pay-per-views like originally it would be like super brawl and bash at the beach or like starcade halloween havoc like some of your cornerstone pay-per-views and then you also have like new pay-per-views being added like uncensored world war three sold out slamboree and then by the time you got to the late 90s, you know, when wrestling started getting hot again. So WCW was really going all out with some of their pay-per-views by having them held like every single month. Like 12 uh, pay-per-views, 12 months a year. And WWE would end up doing the same thing. Like especially when they started getting uh, back on track and started to, you know, with bringing in the Attitude Era and all these like pay-per-views like... Judgment Day, Backlash, No Mercy, Unforgiven, Fully Loaded, etc., etc. 
and it seems to be a trend that still goes on to this day you know even by the time you got to the original brand split when they started to doing like one of those brand exclusive pay-per-views where you would have like raw wrestlers competing on one pay-per-view and then you have like a smackdown uh roster competing in another pay-per-view that's exclusive to that particular brand so you would have like great american bash came along and then you had taboo tuesday which became cyber sunday so my point here is that it seems like WWE just can't seem to help themselves than to really try and mass produce all these pay-per-views like having them so close to each other you have like two pay-per-views a month in certain months of the year trim back on some of these unnecessary pay-per-views like you know for instance stomping grounds you know while it honestly wasn't as bad of a show as some folks make it out to be but at the same time it's kind of like was that pay-per-view really necessary and you could definitely really tell that WWE is just kind of running through the motions like okay so we're just basically going to copy and paste matches from the previous event we're going to do like rematches from our previous pay-per-views so we're just going to try and just get that over with and then move on from there and i really feel like with the oversaturation of some of these pay-per-views or special events i think that's also played a a big factor as to how wb's quality has dropped so hard and I can understand, you know, WWE has their own streaming service with the WWE Network. And they've been uh, running that streaming service for five years. So I can understand where they're coming from. And, you know, they're trying to, you know, utilize their content to the best of their ability and presenting with all these network specials and documentaries and all those variety specials that they do. So, I mean, I can't understand why they want to do that. What I want to do here is to kind of, you know, basically brainstorm some ideas of what uh, pay-per-views or special events I would personally like to see. And some of it may not be practical, much like Good Mike Work was saying in his video when he was coming up with some of his ideas of how he would structure his pay-per-view calendar. I think it would work best if pay-per-views were less than 10 pay-per-views a year. And that may sound very ideal, but I think the less you have of some of these shows, the better the quality that your uh, product will be. Like, especially when it comes to buying more time to build up for your storylines and your feuds so that once it comes time for some of these pay-per-views to take place, it would feel like a big deal. Like, so that's what this purpose of this video is going to be about. So I might as well just go ahead and get started on this fantasy booking of this pay-per-view schedule that I have here and just how I would structure some of these shows. And there will be some uh, pay-per-views that are some months where there won't be any pay-per-views at all. So I'll definitely make note of that as well. Starting off at January, we're going to have the Royal Rumble. Now, the Royal Rumble has been a staple for WWE pay-per-views. So I'm definitely keeping Royal Rumble in January. Not necessarily going to touch on that. So I'm not going to, you know, just move it around to another month. So I would definitely keep Royal Rumble in January. Now, I know that some of these big four pay-per-views that they have in recent years, they definitely have gone out their way. And I like a lot of these shows have gone a lot longer I mean, ever since with the launching of the WWE Network and some of these shows running more than the traditional three to four hours of a typical WWE pay-per-view. One thing I would change is to definitely trim down the time for some of these big four pay-per-views. Like, do we really need to see a Royal Rumble pay-per-view go as long as six hours? Like, really? Yeah, I think the Women's Royal Rumble, to me, in my personal opinion, should be a match that likely should happen every other year or every couple years for a Women's Royal Rumble match to take place at the said pay-per-view. And I think that would basically give more time for some of the undercard matches to kind of get their focus and get their shine on. I have all the respect for all the 
female wrestlers that work their butt off. I don't want to phase it out completely, but I think the Women's Royal Rumble match should be something that should be treated as very special. A match that would take place like every couple years. I really feel that they should definitely trim down some of these hours when it comes to some of the big four pay-per-views. Like, does it really need to go on six, seven hours? So definitely would go back to having some of these big four pay-per-views to be traditional like three or four hours uh, particularly in this case with the Royal Rumble this would be like three hours in my world just a minor tweak I guess you could say uh, so there you go at that all right so we're gonna move on to February now initially I was on the fence whether I wanted a pay-per-view in February or not and it took me a little while to kind of consider exactly what particular pay-per-view name that I would like to see back in February, obviously being like No Way Out or Elimination Chamber. I know there's Fastlane in actuality. I gave it some thought because I want to focus more on the build to WrestleMania as opposed to some filler type pay-per-view just to kind of get in the way. I decided to bring back the Evolution pay-per-view from October of 2018. And this Evolution pay-per-view, you might remember being an all-female-driven wrestling pay-per-view. Why not use this opportunity to have some of these female competitors within the women's division, whether it be from Raw, SmackDown, NXT, have them all kind of come together and to produce this glorified show. And granted, I know that International Women's Day is normally held in March, so you would think logically that you would have a pay-per-view like this to take place in March to coincide with International Women's Day or International Women's Month. But I know that WrestleMania is around the corner, and I don't want that pay-per-view and evolution to overlap one another and you know even given the fact that having two pay-per-views in one single month is complete overkill in my opinion especially if you have these two pay-per-views being so close to one another would it hurt to have a pay-per-view like evolution a month early i don't think so I mean, then again, you had the Great American Bash, which WWE had been producing, and they even had their pay-per-view when they were doing the Great American Bash, when they brought that from WCW. They had that pay-per-view in July, as opposed to what uh, WCW had been doing when they held the Great American Bash in June. Having Great American Bash in July, just weeks after Independence Day, I mean, if we can get away with that, then why I don't see what would be the problem of having a pay-per-view like Evolution to take place a month early from International Women's Day, which being in March. I would definitely have Evolution being in February. And one aspect I want to add when it comes to Evolution is having annual tournaments. And that by meaning having Queen of the Ring. And this would be the women's division counterpart to King of the Ring, as we we're all familiar with. So... I also thought that was a really cool when they did the Mae Young Classic during the Evolution pay-per-view from this past October. So I want to kind of keep the idea of having like annual tournament bracket matches and using the moniker as Queen of the Ring where the winner of that tournament would face either the Raw or SmackDown Women's Champion, depending on which brand they're in. Or if you're from NXT in this case, without a shadow of a doubt, you would likely go after the NXT Women's title. I think it would be sort of like Evolution's equivalent to what Money in the Bank was when it used to be an annual tradition ladder match at WrestleMania. So it's kind of like that. And to have like a Queen of the Ring tournament to be contested every year at Evolution and to determine the number one contender to face the Raw, SmackDown, or NXT Women's Champions. So I think this would be kind of a way to kind of bring some value and some uniqueness to uh, this particular pay-per-view devoted to the women's division. As far as the Women's Royal Rumble is concerned, because I know some people are probably like, uh, scratching their heads like what's the fate of that 
uh, stipulation, especially given that the Royal Rumble was from the previous month. What happens to that? I would actually rather have the Women's Royal Rumble take place every few years. So that's going to be my pay-per-view that I would have for February. I mean, I'm not going to bring back No Way Out, unfortunately, as much as I love the No Way Out concept and the Elimination Chamber matches that would be featured. I would just have the main roster just focus on the build of WrestleMania and nothing else. And March, I would actually have WrestleMania on this month. I mean, I know WrestleManias have normally been in April throughout the pay-per-views existence but other than maybe wrestlemania 26 there hasn't really been a wrestlemania in march in over 15 years hard to believe and aside from uh wrestlemania 26 from 2010 it's like we haven't had another wrestlemania event held in march and the reason why i have it in march is because i had royal rumble in january no pay-per-view for the main roster other than the women's division, which have Evolution. And given the excuse of WrestleMania being pushed back, from, well, pushed forward, I guess you could say, from April to March. And I, this should give enough breathing room to really hype up for this show. And you have like two months to build this. And which is a reasonable amount of time to go from one to the other. Much like with the Royal Rumble's case, I would actually have WrestleMania being four hours. And I would actually have this in March. So moving on into April. Now, I've kind of gave it some thought considering that these three pay-per-views in mind when it came to uh, how I would structure some of these uh, pay-per-views to take place. It was a toss-up between Backlash, Extreme Rules, and Payback. Now, it's kind of interesting because all three of those pay-per-views have had a history of coming off the heels of WWE's biggest show. For all us folks that grew up during the Attitude Era, Backlash would be the pay-per-view to come after WrestleMania, and that would be a tradition that would continue for a good 10 years from 99 to 2009, and then eventually coming back in, I believe, 2016, when they revived the brand extension once again, and they were doing like these brand split pay-per-views, and it was supposed to be back up until they decide to nix the pay-per-view in favor of stomping grounds. But yeah, Backlash used to be the pay-per-view that would come off the heels of WrestleMania. It would be kind of the unofficial like WrestleMania revenge or WrestleMania part due. You would have all these like rematches of feuds from the previous pay-per-view. Also on other occasions when it comes to some of these Backlash main events, you wouldn't get just rematches but maybe you would have like two feuds all kind of join together and make it like some kind of like triple threat or a fatal four-way where you have storylines continue from wrestlemania and then carry over into the summer that's been a tradition that's been going on throughout the history of april pay-per-views when it comes to wwe so I have no issue with that necessarily. If you would like to bring back Backlash, I mean, I'd be up for it too. You know, Extreme Rules, which eventually replaced Backlash beginning in 2010 when they were starting to really go all the way with their gimmick-driven pay-per-views. And Extreme Rules would be, you know, it started off as like a June pay-per-view and then they moved it around like April or May after WrestleMania. Extreme Rules would carry over throughout most of the 2010s up until a few years ago when I think that pay-per-view and eventually Payback, which would normally come after Extreme Rules, so they like swap around the schedule, vice versa, so Payback would come first and then Extreme Rules would come afterwards. I would definitely be up for any of those three pay-per-views to serve as the April pay-per-view. I know they're not doing a Payback pay-per-view this year, but they could always bring it back eventually, like they've been doing with some of their old pay-per-views as well. I, I definitely would like to see Payback, uh, which is like one of the few like WWE names that I, at least I could tolerate, especially in, mo in the modern era of the company. Unlike some of the other pay-per-views that they had, like, you know, TLC and Hell in a Cell and all these like unoriginal names that just doesn't seem like they just put a lot of thought of. But I mean, as you know, even though some of those pay-per-views could be very mad to forgettable, but at the same time, I wouldn't necessarily mind them continuing with the payback name. I mean, it's one of those few modern day WWE pay-per-views as far as naming is concerned that at least has some effect to it. I'm open to having all three 
uh, pay-per-views or either one of the three, I should say, to be served as a pay-per-view for April. So there you go at that. Now for June, now as you can see, I'm actually skipping through the month of May. I'm not going to actually have any pay-per-views in May. I'll probably throw in like a couple like WWE Network specials that you wouldn't really find on like pay-per-views. Like you wouldn't go to like Dish Network or Comcast or whatever cable provider you have in order to spend like 60 bucks on a pay-per-view. Uh, but this will be like all like network exclusives. And it may sound pretty weird saying that considering that most of their pay-per-views are also on the network but just like some of the like minor events that don't necessarily reflect the continuity of uh, the storylines being taken place in the, on the main roster some of them will be glorified house shows or some of them won't relate to uh, what's going on in the main roster like you know with nxt kind of being a spin-off of wwe with their own set of roster and talent so I think May could be used as that time. Uh, but you could probably still do like some of those uh, international shows that you do, like the Super Showdown events. Even though I don't necessarily agree with the location that those events are being held, especially given circumstances with Saudi Arabia and the controversy that's been uh, all the talk of the town. You could definitely honestly use May as a time to kind of take a break from the traditional pay-per-views and to kind of focus on the next pay-per-view that I have for June. Now, when I originally thought about this, I decided whether if I wanted to have King of the Ring come back and take the place of a June pay-per-view or have Money in the Bank to be as the annual pay-per-view for that respective month. And... You know, as far as June pay-per-views, because this is normally the kind of month where it seems like every year, every few years, WWE just has a habit of constantly changing around pay-per-views and, you know, and, you know, coming up with, like, different pay-per-view names. And it's kind of like one of those, like, experimentations to best describe this situation or this scenario for that matter. And over the years, we had a pay-per-view called Fatal 4-Way. And then we had, like, Capital Punishment. And, and at times, they would bring back a pay-per-view like No Way Out. Money in the Bank would be tossed around between June and July. And the same goes with Battleground. And speaking of Battleground, uh, that's actually going to be the name for this pay-per-view, actually. I'm going to uh, continue on with the Battleground name. But it's not going to be the kind of Battleground the kind of throwaway pay-per-view that we all grown to be familiar as. But I'm actually going to try and do something a bit different with this pay-per-view and try to make it a lot more, uh, I guess you could say, uh, significant, to best put it as. Now, you know, going back to when I was discussing a little bit about King of the Ring and Money in the Bank. So this would be a sort of a innovation that I kind of thought of, basically fusing the concepts of two different match stipulations and you know king of the ring was a traditional june pay-per-view for the longest time from 93 to 2002 but due to poor buy rates eventually WWE decided to discontinue that pay-per-view and they would replace it with like shows like bad blood or great american bash and we really haven't had like a very consistent june pay-per-view and I guess for a while we did have payback. So what I want to do is rather than, you know, completely getting rid of some of these, uh, like, money in the bank completely. Because, you know, as stale as money in the bank has become over the years where wrestlers who retrieved the briefcase and they would gr be granted a contract to challenge uh, the WWE champion or universal champion or get like some kind of title opportunity and they could cash it in at any time within a year. So I just really feel that when it comes to the concept of the money in the bank, I really feel that it's kind of gotten to a point where it's really formulaic and there's just not enough 
Like, there's just not enough fairness, to be exact. I mean, it worked with Edge because, you know, to kind of coincide with his characteristics of being, like, this ultimate opportunist, that he'll do everything he can. Like, even if a said WWE champion was not 100%, then he would go in and cash it in when that wrestler is, like, completely burnt out and can't really, like, defend himself. I just really feel that when it comes to what we've seen when it comes to wrestlers cashing in money in a bank, it, it just feels like an like a very easy to predict event. And I, I, I definitely loved what they did with Lucha Underground, where they kind of tweaked around a similar concept with Aztec Warfare. And I kind of thought to myself, it's like, why can't we have like when the wrestler wins that respective? prize it's like you know can we use that contract to grant ourselves a potential wwe title shot like can we like schedule it like months in advance and give it a set date as opposed to just doing it on the fly and doing it when you least expect it so that's kind of the idea that i even though i don't want to necessarily completely get rid of uh the money in the bank stipulation, but I'm actually going to kind of retool uh, the concept of it. And what I did is by fusing in with King of the Ring and Battleground, this would be sort of a 32-man tournament in May. Sort of like King of the Ring, especially in 2000, where they had like a 32-man tournament, which is the largest tournament bracket that they had at that point. So throughout May, I would contest some of these uh, tournament brackets, and you would have... Uh, given a big plethora of talent that w that we've had in WWE in recent years. Just to really give them like a chance to kind of showcase themselves. So you would have a 32-man bracket, and that would continue throughout May and transitioning over into June. When it comes down to six, seven, or eight wrestlers would be competing in a ladder match with the briefcase and whichever contract that from... A certain brand like if you're wrestling from raw or smackdown then you know you'll be going after that said respective top tier championship so if you're a raw superstar and you won the king of the battleground ladder match not only would you be declared as that nickname but you would also be awarded with the said guaranteed contract of a potential uh universal title shot to try to kind of re Freshen the concept of the money in the bank, but also simultaneously bringing back King of the Ring. So I think by fusing two of the concept matches together in order to create the King of the Battleground is basically going to be kind of the uh, the theme of this particular pay per view. You know, as opposed to being like a throwaway pay per view with Battleground, this will be kind of more. I really want to treat this like it is one of the major WWE pay-per-view calendar events of the year, you know, alongside the Royal Rumbles, the WrestleManias, Survivor Series, and SummerSlam. So the annual King of the Battleground series. But that was kind of how what I had in mind when I thought about whether if I wanted to have King of the Ring or Money in the Bank as the annual pay-per-view for June. I mean, let me know what you think about that idea. Hopefully I clarified that to the best of my ability. And then we go to July. So I'm not going to have any pay-per-views for July. This will be just sort of a focus into the next major pay-per-view being SummerSlam. So July could be another one of those network specials that you could do. Now I kind of had an idea whether I want to bring back Cyber Sunday. But like as a broadcast TV special as opposed to like a traditional pay-per-view in a sense. And it could be something that you would see on like Monday Night Raw and they would do like occasional specials that they do. So maybe you could do that on an episode of Raw or maybe like a separate uh, TV special in the veins of Saturday Night's main event or what WCW did with Clash of the Champions. If you wanted to, no July pay-per-view for those that are wondering. So SummerSlam, I would still keep it in August. It's been a tradition since its inception in 1988. So don't really need that much elaborate discussion about it so uh, SummerSlam is going to remain in August. September I will not have a pay-per-view event. This could just be another one of those 
opportunities where you would have different uh, network events like an NXT show, like NXT TakeOver and 205 Live pay-per-view reserved for Cruiserweights if you wanted to do one. But nothing too significant. I know some folks might want to bring back Unforgiven or uh, Night of Champions or clash of champions as it's now called i thought about bringing back fall brawl for w uh, for uh fall brawl for nxt and in recent years they've been doing the war games matches particularly in the on the evening before survivor series but i wouldn't mind if they had brought back fall brawl solely for nxt's special pay-per-views I mean, I know earlier this, you know, just recently they had a NXT TakeOver events that did not land on the evening of another WWE main roster pay-per-view like they normally do. But there was actually a pay-per-view just recently where NXT TakeOver, I think they had it in May. I believe it may have been in the UK or it may have just been a regular NXT TakeOver event, but it did not, it did not land on the evening before another scheduled WWE pay-per-view. So yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily have a pay-per-view for WWE that year, or at least that month alone. No WWE pay-per-view event in September. Now for October, I always wanted WWE to do a, like a Halloween-themed pay-per-view. This is one thing that I would definitely uh, agree with good mic work. And uh, having Halloween Havoc would also be really cool if they could afford the trademark license to it. It doesn't even have to be called Halloween Havoc, but would be cool if they did but this could be like an entirely different name it could be called something else and having like this traditional halloween themed pay-per-view consisting of some decorations like you would have some pumpkins and tombstones and all these like skeletons all over like the entrance ramp and all over the stage and that's kind of one thing i really loved about some of the old sets, especially with WCW when it came to Halloween Havoc. And they would just get all creative with their arena sets and all these props and whatnot. With WWE, I mean, they're really good at creating all these sets, especially when they really put forth the effort. Because I know a lot of these uh, pay-per-views in recent years all use the same set, unless it was like something like WrestleMania, which is held on like outside stadiums. So other than WrestleMania, there's just hardly any creativeness. That's something that's been missing for quite a long time. And Halloween Havoc could be that pay-per-view. And even though, like I said, I mean, it doesn't have to be called Halloween Havoc if WWE can't afford the licensing to the name, but something along the lines of like a Halloween themed pay-per-view event. I know some folks maybe say like, you know, bring back no mercy. If I had to choose what the October pay-per-view is going to be, it will be... Uh, sort of like a Halloween theme pay-per-view event. And then if it, if you can, I mean, it would be cool to get the licensing to ho the name of Halloween Havoc and, you know, go from there. So I, I would definitely be supportive of WB producing their own Halloween pay-per-view. And November is going to be Survivor Series. I'm definitely going to keep it at that. And then December, I actually agree with uh, Good Mike work on this. I thought he really nailed this idea and having exactly no pay-per-view wrestlers could take a couple weeks off get themselves recuperated heading into the new year where wrestlemania season will officially kick off in january so maybe do like one of those uh tv specials like those year-end recaps that they do tribute to the troops the slammies which they did maybe like a couple years ago and then they stopped doing it i definitely like that idea so what do you guys thoughts are considering my fantasy pay-per-view calendar uh, i mean do you agree do you disagree would you bring back some pay-per-views would you come up with some new concepts i mean do you agree that there's too many pay-per-views and maybe they should cut back on some of them so feel free to comment down in the comment section below i would gladly appreciate hearing your guys feedback thank you all guys for watching and until next time this is the Gold Standard Caesar 924 signing out.